project a bit, tell you something about the project goals, the project history, and the current status. The second part of the talk will be a basic SIR overview where we will uh, take a look at SIR features, we will take a look at what, at what SIR can do, at what SIR cannot do. Uh, we will uh, describe the architecture a little bit. And in the last part, I will try to describe a typical SIP server setup based on SIR, where we will uh, focus on scalability, on high availability and issues connected to such uh, connected to large setups mainly. So some notes about IPTEL.org. IPTEL.org is a non-profit organization originally initiated by FAG Focus, which is a German research institute for open communication system. Uh, we started in 1999. The first outcome of IPTEL.org work was SIP tutorial by Durham Sisalem and Yuri Kudhan. At this time, there was almost no documentation regarding SIP and related protocols, so this was a big success. Uh, we, also, we are also running a free available SIP service where anyone can uh, take a SIP user agent, register to it, play with the SIP server, uh, and test it. Originally, we were running uh, this SIP service based on third-party software, namely Cisco and Movida, but it turned out that it was not flexible enough, so we started to write our own hacks to make it work, and this is basically how SIR was born. We started working on SIR in uh, 2001, uh, and the result of this work is nowadays known as the SIP Express Router. Later on, we also, um, we also started to work on additional applications for management, that serve up, which is a web interface for SER. There is the RTP proxy, which is very often needed when dealing with SIP user agent behind NAT. There is SAMS, SIP Express Media Server, which is extension to SER, uh, and MyStan. Uh, last, uh, later when uh, the software was in a really usable state, FAG Focus decided to create a spin-off which would sell uh, commercial systems based on SIR. This is how Iptel Org uh, company was born. That company was last year acquired by Tekelec and now is focusing on developing uh, SIP infrastructure for 3GPP networks and for IMS. Iptelerk continues as a non-profit site, still sponsored by FAG Focus. Uh, the purpose of this site is to promote voice over IP based on open standards, namely SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, developed, developed in the IETF and RTP. We also try to promote the use of open source or free voice over IP software. There is the free SIP service, which is often used by developers of SIP and devices to make sure that they are interoperable. Uh, we also maintain a documentation side with standards and internet drafts related to SIP. And as you probably already know, we have been developing a set of tools to implement uh, open source solution for SIP based setups for internet telephony service providers. A bit of history. Uh, first SER version was born in uh, September 2001, originally as a hack to make Cisco PSTN gateways work. Two weeks later, we had a flexible configuration language <coughs> as, it, as it is still in SER now. Uh, first modules were developed in, uh, in early 2002. That those modules were implementing mainly uh, functionality needed to create a SIP registrar, to create digest authentication, to implement record routing. In 2002, we were attending the first SIPIT event with SER running on NPDA. Uh, Later on, SIPSAC was created, which is often used for monitoring purposes. This is a, 
command line tool for, for monitoring and for sending SIP messages. And in the end of in the end of 2002, there was the first major external contribution, which was support for Enum protocol. In 2003, uh, Rafael Coefit began working on SAMS. As of today, there are estimated tens of thousands of SIR installations worldwide. Some of them are biggest biggest SIP installation today. Uh, Last year, the, the development group of SIR forked, and there is now a, one, uh, one a surfer called OpenSIR, which has and the developers of OpenSIR try to aim for short release cycles. So there are basically two projects which do approximately the same. Uh, as I already said, SIR is being used by many developers of SIP and devices as a reference implementation and as a test implementation for their phone. So we receive a lot of uh, questions regarding this. SIR is currently powering some of the largest SIP setups. Those that are well known are FWD, uh, Freewall Dialog by Pulver, SIPGate, and SIP4, for example. Some of the biggest setups currently are known to handle about 80,000 subscribers on a single host. So there are such setups and we know it works. SIR is also part of SIP.edu initiative, which is a working group uh, initiated by Internet2. Uh, they are trying to promote voice over IP to universities. Uh, there are several universities running really big setups. Yale, for example, Columbia University, University of California in Los Angeles, and so on. SIP Edu was also contributing to SIR. They developed a simple uh, module implementing simple uh, support, which is SIP extensions for, for presence and instant messaging. <coughs> There are even some embedded setups. People are trying to run SIR in uh, wireless routers or in DSL routers. One port is on Siemens Gigaset. Another one, there is a Milkfish project, which is a sort of embedded device running SIR inside. Now, as, you're, as most of you are probably familiar with it, there is there is some level of confusion about what is SIR and what is SIR not. So SIR is a SIP proxy server, which means it can receive SIP messages, it can forward SIP messages, it can uh, forward SIP replies. SIR can be configured as a registrar, that means it can receive register messages from SIP phones. Uh, SIP phones are using register messages to announce that they are online and that they are able to receive calls. It can be configured as a registrar server, uh, as a red redirect server, which means SIR will uh, receive a request and redirect it to another host. It can be used as a simple present server. And uh, in terms of of the specification of SIP, SIR is transaction stateful, which means it, it keeps uh, state in memory for a short period of time during uh, call creation and during call termination, but it doesn't keep any state in memory for the duration of the call. What is SIR not? SIR is not a back-to-back -back user agent. Back-to-back -back user agent is a uh, basically connection of two user agents. One of them can receive a call, the other one will initiate a call, and then, then, then they will relay SIP messages. Uh, this, this kind of network uh, entity has some useful features, but SIR cannot be, sir cannot be configured as a vector back user agent. SIR is not dialogue stateful. That means SIR has no idea of calls in progress. SIR is not a PBX, it's not a packet branch, ex uh, packet branch exchange. Uh, it does not deal with media. It means 
no RTP streams go through SIR. SIR just deals with signaling, that means SIP messages. For RTP or for media streams, there are, there are other applications which can be used uh, in conjunction with SIR. And it's not a PSTN gateway. It has no support for, for PSTN gateway cards or PSTN interfaces. So SIR itself is, is not enough to run a fully featured SIP network. It can be used in the core. It can take care of all the SIP signaling. But you'll also need some additional applications if you would like to implement things like P PSTN interconnection, PBX functions, and so on. Some features. Uh, SIR is written in uh, C, and the primarily it has been optimized for speed. At the time when, when we were try when, when we started working on SIR, most of the SIP applications were were um, pretty big and slow. We decided to take a different different approach and tried to implement something which is really efficient and small. This approach has some drawbacks. SIR is not easy, cannot be easily reused in other applications. There are no well-defined APIs, except for internal APIs. Uh, there is no easy way of writing uh, writing applications on top of SIR, but it's really fast. If you if you optimize your setup, it can really handle a lot of SIP traffic. It can even saturate a fast Ethernet interface. SIR is designed in a modular way, and that means we try to keep a relatively small, small SIR core, which contains only functionality needed by <coughs> most modules or functionality shared across several parts of, of SIR. Uh, there is a really flexible configuration language, which uh, is similar to C or Perl. This configuration language tells SIR how to, how to route SIP requests, how to change them, how to send replies, and so on. When it comes to support for databases, there is support for MySQL, there is support for Postgres. We have an LDAP interface which can be used to query an external LDAP server for subscriber's <coughs> profile. We have radio support which can be used for radios based authentication and accounting. SIR is strictly 3261 RFC compliant. We try to make it as compliant as possible. Uh, we have a web-based <coughs> administration interface written, uh, written in PHP, which uh, can be used for administration purposes. There, there is an admin interface where you can control uh, the domain supported by, by SIR, there you can control uh, configuration options. There is also administration interface for users where user can see, for example, the list of missed calls, the list of received calls. They can change the settings and so on. SIR so is not traversal capable. We have quite many extensions to make uh, SIP user agents who are behind network. So there are several functions which can help you to build such a setup. And it's fairly portable. It runs on almost any on, on almost any POSIX compliant system. There have been reports from FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, and uh, Mac, uh, I think from Darwin as well. So almost anything that is POSIX compliant can run there. But because there are some impl some uh, some. Uh, Optimizations written in assembler, sometimes some work is needed to port it to new architectures. <coughs> SIR is licensed under the GP under the terms of GPL. There are currently about twenty developers developing new features for the core and the core modules like registrar and user lock. FAG focus is trying to stay an exclusive copyright owner. But anyone can freely contribute to the project, <coughs> write a new module, write a new extension. 
but changes to existing modules are subject to approval by corresponding by corresponding maintainers. Uh, OpenSer, for example, has a less strict rules, so there people can uh, people can uh, <coughs> modify even existing modules more easily. There is a very simple diagram that shows the structure of SER. So there is the SER core, which takes care of the transport layer, which also exposes the module interface to modules. And then there are several modules implementing, for example, digest authentication, access to databases, uh, record routing, and so on. Features provided by SER core are only limited, so if you you can still run just circular without any modules, but it will not be very useful. It contains it can just simply forward a request and that's it. Most of the functions or functionality that are needed are provided by modules. Each module can uh, can expose one or more script functions. Script functions can be then uh, executed from the configuration language. Each module can provide a set of parameters which are used to control the behavior of that module. And there are also special variables. The special variables can be used to access uh, various parts of, the, of a SIP message or uh, can provide some additional information. For example, there is a TLS module which can expose a lot of information about the TLS level. TLS is transport layer security. And each of the modules can also provide management functions like reload of data in stored in uh, the memory cache, uh, changes to module parameters, and so on. In recent versions, we have pretty flexible management interface based on XML RPC so that it's very easy to access all the functions, all the functions inside SIR. Uh, for example, reloading uh, some information <coughs> from database is a matter of three lines of code in Python. So this is very, this is very easy. Here is a very short configuration file so that you can see how does it look like. The configuration file consists four parts. The first one, now highlighted in red, are some generic generic settings for the server, things like debugging level, uh, whether SIR should fork and create additional processes or not, if uh, debugging messages should be sent to standard output or not. The second part uh, is a set of load module commands which are used to load additional modules in, in the SIR core. Uh, the modules are stored on local file system in the form of libraries. The next part is the configuration of modules. Uh, module, each module can export a set of configuration parameters. They can be changed using modparam commands. And the most important one is the routing part. This is the part which describes uh, the routing logic implemented in the server. The server without this configuration interface wouldn't know what to do with the SIP messages. It doesn't know how to change them, how to forward them. All this logic is described in, uh, in this section. And when SIR receives a SIP message, it starts executing this section and it will execute one command after another until uh, it hits the end of the section or it hits break and then it will stop. You can do pretty much everything from, uh, from this section. You can change the content of the messages. You can change headers. You can send a reply. You can forward the request. Uh, you can maintain some internal state, and so on. <coughs> this configuration example shows only one, sec one route section, but there are more types. Uh, so on this picture, 
this picture shows gives an overview of operation of SIR. As I already said, SIR is a very simple message forwarder. It can uh, receive a SIP request, forward it, it can generate a reply, and this is all it can do. It doesn't know any it doesn't know about existing calls or, or anything like that. So when SIR receives a requ uh, request in uh, this example, it's invite, for example, then it will start executing uh, the route section described in the previous configuration file. So once, a once an invite comes, uh, the main route section will be executed and the commands listed in that route section can modify it, they can uh, forward the request or generate a reply. Once one of the commands decides to generate, decides to forward the request, uh, SIR will execute another type of the route section which is called branch route. Because SIR has a, uh, SIP has a feature called forking, that means if SIR receives a single invite request, it can fork it to multiple destinations at the same time. But there might be functions which you would like to do on, uh, on a particular branch only. And this is exactly what branch route blocks are for. Branch route block is executed for, for every branch. In this picture, we have two of them. So just before sending the invite request, branch route block will be executed for the top branch. In the next step, when SIR generates another invite request, it will execute the same branch route block again. So there is the main route block which is executed for incoming requests and there can be branch route blocks which are executed for outgoing, for outgoing requests. <coughs> Try to turn it on a little bit. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. So there are two types of blocks for request, and there are also two types of blocks for processing replies. When the downstream element uh, generates a reply, in this example it's for 86, and this reply hits sir, it will execute another type of route block which is called on reply, on reply route block and in this block sir can uh, again do whatever it likes it can change the reply it can um, change the status code it can change the reason phrase it can forward the reply on reply route blocks are executed again for for each branch so later when for example 200 OK arise from the other user agent, it will execute the on reply route block again. And finally, the last, the last routing block is fail route, which is executed only if the reply forwarded upstream is, is a negative reply. That means 300 something, 400 something, 500 something. In this fail route block, SIR can uh, do things like serial forking, for example, if, if it receives a um, negative reply, then it can decide, okay, that user agent is not reachable, I can try to forward it to voicemail or to some other application. And this is exactly the type of functionality which can be uh, implemented in fail route blocks. Fail route are, blocks are executed only for negative replies. In this example, when 200 OK will be forwarded upstream. No failure out blocks, block will be executed. So this is all that SIR does. It's a very simple application, very simple message forwarder driven by a couple of routing blocks. No more complexity, no more no, no uh, notion of cost or anything like this. Uh, SIR is transaction stateful in SIP. Uh, requests and all responses associated with that request are arranged in transactions. So transaction basically is 
a request and all the responses for that request. Mm -hmm. Sarah is transaction stateful, that means it, when it receives a request, it will create a data structure in memory and that data structure will be released <coughs> once the final reply, in this example it would be 200 OK, is forwarded upstream. The big advantage of this approach is that we don't have to keep any session state for the duration of the call, which makes a really big performance difference and that's <coughs> also the reason why SIR can be so fast. So once we forward, once someone picks up the call and we forward the 200 OK, SIR forgets everything. Later when uh, one of the parties decides to hang up the call, the user agent sends a buy and uh, when SIR receives the buy, it will create the transaction contest again and again forget it after a short while. So there is, there is no possibility to find out how <coughs> many how many active calls are there in SIR. There is no possibility to terminate a call in SIR because SIR is only transaction stateful. It's not dialog stateful. Here is an uh, overview of a typical SIR-based setup. SIR, it, SIR itself is not enough to implement something like this, so there, is a, there are some additional applications which are needed. Uh, one of them is SIRWeb, highlighted in green. That's the administration interface where users can uh, administer their, their profile. Uh, the communication between SIRWeb and SIR is now based on XML RPC. Uh, this, this setup has been designed for the most hostile environment, which is the public internet. Uh, in the public internet, we have absolutely no control over the network, we have no control over the devices that users will be using, we have no control over the net. So we have to assume that most of the phones are behind net, that we cannot change the configuration of the phones, and so on. So we try to change as little as possible in the user agent when something needs to be reconfigured. It should be done on the server. Uh, to make phones behind network, we also need a server called RTP proxy because there are situations where two user agents cannot talk directly to each other. There is no possibility to establish direct end-to-end -end communication. For, so for this purpose, we need RTP proxy, which will relay all, this, all the RTP traffic through, through a third-party host, usually located in the public internet. There is some communication between SIR and between RTP proxy. This communication is implemented using a proprietary protocol, which is very simple and text-based, just it's not documented anywhere. Uh, in, this, in this case, SIR needs to tell the RTP proxy there is a new call set up, reserve some ports, reserve some resources, and make sure that you can relay uh, the <coughs> media stream. At the end of the call, it will again uh, tell the RTP proxy, okay, the call is now finished. You can release all the, all the resources. Uh, there is there can be also some additional applications like SAM or Asterisk, which, which can be implemented, which can be used to implement additional functionality like voicemail, PSTN gateways, and so on. And there is also the database server, which can be MySQL, Postgres, or anything like that. SIR so stores all the information about subscribers, their usernames, passwords, and so on in the database. <coughs> this is a very simple setup where we have only one SIR instance. This kind of setup can, uh, can run, can serve about 60 to 80,000 of subscribers. So if you have less than that, then uh, a single machine for SIR single machine for RTP proxy is, is enough.
when there is a need to handle more subscribers, uh, then we need to scale it somehow, which means we will need more SIR boxes, we will need more RTP proxy boxes, and <coughs> split the traffic, the signaling traffic, and the media traffic uh, among those boxes. Um, <coughs> RTP proxy, for example, has a different requirement than the SIP server because in the worst case, RTP proxy needs 64 kilobits per second of data traffic to relay, to relay a call. So it's, it's very likely that you will first run out of network connectivity on the RTP proxy. It's not so likely that you would run run into performance issues in the SIP server, but, but it will eventually happen. So what we typically do in such situations is we set up multiple SIP server boxes, multiple RTP proxy, RTP proxy boxes, and then we put a load balancer in front of them. The load balancer can again be implemented using SIR. There is a, there is a special SIR, SIR module called Dispatcher. This module can uh, implement hashing based on the contents of from or request URI header field. So it knows, <coughs> it knows uh, the home proxy of, of every subscriber. Provisioning applications like Serveb can uh, implement the same algorithm to find the corresponding proxy directly or they can run all the traffic through the load balancer as well. Because, for example, Serveb is not based on XMLRPC, which is very similar to SIP. In fact, XMLRPC is using HTTP. So we can run it through the load balancer as well. There is no difference for SIR between HTTP or between SIP. One difficult issue is high availability. Operators of PSTN networks often uh, claim that they can reach five nines availability, so internet telephony service providers are forced to implement the same or, and claim that they can reach five nines as well. However, in the public internet, this is not really easy, especially because of not perfect implementations that are available. Most of the SIP phones which are on the market right now cannot handle DNS SRV failover, for example. They cannot, uh, <coughs> they, they will not try to reach another server when the master server fails. And you couldn't really rely on uh, such, such advanced feature in a SIP user agents. So we need to take care of this on the server because Nowadays, most of the SIF phones are behind a net. Uh, there is only one server which can reach the phones, and that is the server uh, to which the SIF phone sent a register request. If you have a, if you have a SIF user agent behind a net, you, you can only communicate with the server to which you initiated the communications, which is typically the registrar or the proxy server. No other server can reach the phone because the net would drop the packet. For this reason, if we want to implement high availability and if we would like to have a backup server, we need to migrate the IP address. So we need to have two, two servers, both of them configured using the same IP address and they are using a, a VRP, VRP stands for virtual redundant router protocol. It's a sort of, it's a heartbeat protocol where the master server in the group uh, sends heartbeat packets to all the servers in the group and when one of the backup servers stops receiving the heartbeat packets or for some reason they lose communication, it will send an ARP response to the switch and take over the IP address and continue the processing. So, switch over from, from master to backup in this situation takes 
approximately four seconds. So there is a four second delay <coughs> where uh, the user agent will be unreachable. <coughs> when it comes when it comes to RTP proxy, high availability, uh, there is the possibility to use exactly the same scenario as here. In this case, the RTP proxy would need to share, would, would need to communicate the information about the user agent. But we typically do not, do not implement this because if, if one of the servers fail, existing calls will be gone, but still user agents can, can try to make a new call. One more thing here. Uh, the two SIR instances and the two databases on the pictures are separated. There is no central database in the background. We also typically replicate all SIP register messages to the backup instance, and this way the master and the backup uh, SIP server instance can stay synchronized. When uh, the master instance fails, the, backups, the backup server instance will immediately have exactly the same data as the master and can start uh, taking over the load immediately. Here's a picture showing what <coughs> happens when uh, the master instance fails. The backup server will send an ARP response, which will make the switch uh, on the picture to update the ARP table, and all the future SIP traffic will be sent uh, to the backup instance. Say it again. The transaction is lost. This is not a really big issue because if transaction is lost, then uh, Sir can still relay the SIP messages statelessly. Some things will not be working. For example, accounting will not be working, not traversal will not be working as well. But for example, for buy request, when you try to, when you hang up a user agent and send the user engine will send a buy request, such, such a request would make it to the other party even if, if, if it is forwarded statelessly. So there is a short window uh, at the beginning of each call which is sensitive to server failures, but during the call there are no problems. The <coughs> server can fail, there is no communication uh, besides RTP between the user agents, so it will still work. So this, the pictures that I showed here, this is how, for example, the public SIP service which we run on niptel.org is operating. It's, it has been designed for the public internet where we have no control uh, over, over the network and over the user agent. Everything else is simpler. If you, if you, if you have an internet telephony service provider company and you know what kind of user agents your user are using, then it it's much, it can be done uh, easier. You don't need VRP, for example, if you have only user agents that support uh, SRE failover. There is no need to have a central backend database, although it can be done now. We have tested sir, this recent MySQL cluster installations. It seems to work reasonably well and it seems to scale well. This kind of infrastructure can handle millions of subscribers. That means uh, you can scale it to millions of phones uh, simply by adding boxes. Load balancing is based on server side because load balancing is done by the load balancer. There is no need to change the configuration of the user agent. If you, if you need to migrate a user agent from one server to another, and it doesn't require any proprietary extensions, 
any 3261 compliant user agent would work or should work. Okay, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead. VRP is a separate package. There is there is free implementation of VRP daemon. Uh, super application is implemented in SER. There is a special command which you can use to forward all the traffic from a master server to backup. Uh, what do you mean by call account? Right. So, so the, the question was if, if, if there is any possibility to use RTP proxy and SER for accounting purposes. Well, to some extent, yes. There is an there is there is an alternative RTP proxy called Media Proxy, which can uh, which can display a list of existing calls could be used for accounting, but this is not reliable. So it wouldn't work reliably. If you if you use this information for billing purposes, then probably the only the only place where you can generate reliable billing data would be the PSTN gateway. There are situations where it, it can happen that you do not receive a buy, for example, then you wouldn't know uh, what was the duration of the call, so it, it's not easy. Radius, in, so accounting in radius, uh, so for each call, the server would generate two records. It would generate the start record at the beginning of the call, and then it would generate the stop record. So you have two records, and you have to correlate them. They can be correlated using, uh, using the value of call ID from tag and to tag. All this information is sent to the radius server by server. So you can then, in uh, the processing application, use this to correlate start and stop request. You need you need a dialog stateful element for this because to be able to be able to generate a buy on SER side, which is what you need to terminate the call, you need the value of, of several header fields. You need the call ID value, you need a from header to header, and you have to make sure that you form the request properly, otherwise the user agent would refuse it. So unless you can extract this information, store it somewhere and use this when generating buy, then no. You, you would need to implement a back-to-back -back user agent which or, or dialogue stateful element to make this possible. Not helper? Yes. It's it's sufficiently reliable for any it was working fine in any setup I have seen. In fact, uh, we had, we had issues in deploying session border controllers because they introduce additional latency. They often screw up signaling. So NetHelper and RTP proxy implemented on the server can do the same. It's just a different place where you can do it. If you deploy NetHelper and RTP proxy, you implement NetTravels on the server. If you, if you install a session border controller, then you can do it uh, in the customer's network on, on user agent premises. But it works. It works fine. And in fact, we are we are not recommending people to use session border controllers because of problems we had in the past. Okay. 
Yes. There is there is a commercial licensing program done by Uptel or by the commercial spin-off. What was it? There was a module for the meter. It was sort of proof, proof of concept, but we, it was never really used in any in any installation because most of the most of the operators would stick.